Okay, so we'll be discussing chapter one, Introduction to Biology, today. So we'll first start uh, with the themes and various concepts in biology, and then move on to discussing the scientific process. So biology, what is biology? Biology is the science that studies life, living things. But what is what exactly is life? So we have created a list of characteristics that living things all have. And we would consider something to be living if and only if it displays all of these properties. So what are those properties? Uh, living things have, must have following. One, it needs to have order. Two, it needs to have sensitivity. It needs to have reproduction, adaptation, growth and development, regulation, homeostasis, and energy processing. Those are the eight things that it needs to display. In the living things are complex and ordered. They are sensitive to stimuli. They respond to their environments. They reproduce in order to keep the species alive. And they adapt to environmental uh, changes to ensure survival. And then they grow and develop throughout the life. And coordination of internal function must be present which is required to maintain the internal balance. And those internal balance and internal functions, much of, them, much of that deals with performing the metabolism. Just to, just to give some example, this toad represents highly organized structure. It has head, has a skin, has certain colors, has cells, tissues, organs, organ systems. The leaves of this mimosa pudica plant will instantly droop and fold when it's touched. But in a few minutes, it will return to its normal state. That is a touch sensitive plant. It's responding to stimuli. And these kittens, although the no two look alike, these kittens have inherited genes from both parents and share many of the same characteristics. Polar bears and other mammals living in ice covered regions they maintain their, their body temperature by generating heat and reducing heat loss through thick furs. And that is adaptation to changes in the environment. And here's a high-flying California condor. A lot of energy is required to fly like that. And obviously, chemical energy derived from food is used to power the flight, which requires metabolism, energy processing. And in, among the living things, there's, there are tw 12 levels of organization. So how are they organized? The, obviously, the smallest is the atom and the most fundamental unit of the matter. It consists of a nucleus surrounded by electrons. There's a nucleus surrounded by electrons. It's a schematic diagram of it. And the molecule is a two or more atoms held together by a chemical bond. And the macromolecule is a large molecule formed by combining small subunits called monomers. And when molecules come together with other molecules to form organelles, small structure found in uh, cells, then we have another level of organization at the level of organelles. And the cells that possess the organelles are the smallest fundamental unit of living organism. This is why we have single cell organisms. And all living things are made up of cells. And cells combine to make the tissue. Tissues are a group of similar cells that carry out the same functions. And organs are the collections of tissues that are grouped together based on their common functions. And then you have the organ systems, which consists of functionally related organs. And the organism is the individual living entity. And the population is all the individual in a species living in a given geographical area. And the community is a set of population inhabiting a particular area. And the ecosystem consists of all living things and all abiotic or non-living things in that given area. And obviously, the biosphere, Earth, shown here is the collection of all ecosystem and it represents the zones of life on earth including 
affecting land, water, and atmosphere. So classifying organisms using domain. This is relatively a new concept. Uh, domains are two types of, uh, three types of domains. Domain bacteria, domain archaea, and domain eukarya. And the domains bacteria and archaea are made up of single cell prokaryotes. They don't have uh, membrane bound nucleus nor organelles. Uh, domain eukarya contain organisms with cells that have membrane bound nucleus and other membrane bound organelles. And because there are approximately 8.7 million living things that's been studied on Earth, we need to have some kind of systematic way of naming and grouping them. And that's where hierarchical taxonomy becomes useful. And originally, it was designed by a scientist named Carl Linnaeus in the 18th century. And what he did is he grouped organisms by their similarities. And each large group gets smoke broken down into smaller subgroups that are even more similar to each other. And this is called the hierarchical taxonomy. So uh, here's an example of hierarchical, hierarchical taxonomy for the species Canis lupus, which include dog and wolves. And domain-wise, they are eukaryotes, and many other things are eukaryotes. So it includes many things that are quite dissimilar. But wolf and a dog are quite similar. As a matter of fact, they can crossbreed. And Linnaeus was also the first person to name organisms using two unique names. We call this binomial naming system. And binomial naming system include using the genus and species name. And they're typically set in italics. And the example would be North American blue jay, which is known as Cyanocita cristata. Genus Cyanocita cristata species. And we're obviously the Homo sapiens. So humans' hierarchical taxonomy includes all these names, Eukarya, Animalia, Cordata, Mammalia, Primate, Hominida, Homo, Sapiens. Uh, there are many branches of biology and subdisciplines. Some examples, uh, molecular biology, which studies the biological processes at the molecular level. And there's microbiology that studies the structure and function of microorganisms. These include microbial physiologists, ecologists, geneticists, among others. And neurobiology studies the biology of nervous system and includes subfields like molecular, cellular, developmental, medical, and computational neurobiology. And here are people digging around the dirt. These are people looking for fossils or other traces of history of life. And they are, they are the paleontologists. And zoologists study animals and plants. And biologists can specialize as biotechnologists, ecologists, physiologists, just to name a few uh, areas. So biology of science and Discoveries in science, like biology, are typically made by a community of researchers who either work individually or together using some kind of agreed on methods. And the science can be defined as knowledge about the natural world. The science doesn't deal with purely moral questions or aesthetic questions, or for that matter, spiritual questions. Scientists tend to use general same general steps to find the answers to important questions, and this is what we call scientific method. The method of research with defined steps 
that ex include experiments and careful observations. This is just merely a guideline that we use and can be altered to fit many different uh, research projects. So the scientific method in steps, it involves, well, in general, it involves hypothesis, scientific theory, and uh, scientific laws. And the suggested hypothesis is a suggested explanation for an event, which can be tested. And scientific theory is already generally accepted, thoroughly tested, and confirmed explanation for a set of observation or phenomenon. And scientific laws typically describe how elements of nature will behave under specific uh, circumstances. And they can be expressed often in mathematical formulas. So example of some findings from biological studies. Here are uh, formerly called blue-green algae. Now we call it cyanobacter or cyanobacteria. It's seen through light microscope over here. And these are some of the oldest life forms. And these things called stromatolites, the, that's these things over here. These are formed by layering of a cyanobacter in shallow waters over millions of years. And biologists may also choose to study some germ here shown in uh, right panel here shown as the Escherichia coli or E. coli. It's a bacterium that is normal resident of our digestive tracts, but they can cause uh, disease outbreaks. And here it's visualized using scanning electron microscope and colorization. So science can be broken down into further subfields like natural sciences, our field of sciences that's related to the physical world and natural its phenomena and processes. These include things like biology, astronomy, geology, physics, chemistry, etc. Some scholars uh, choose to divide natural science further into life sciences and physical sciences, which is fairly common. And Life sciences is obviously the study of living things, including biology. Physical sciences is the, are the study of non-living matter, including astronomy, physics, and chemistry. Some disciplines, like biophysics, biochemistry, like to build on both uh, disciplines of sciences. So how do we make a scientific inquiry? We use two methods of logical thinking. In, in trying to understand and explain the world. One is the inductive reasoning. The other is the deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning involves using specific observation to arrive at general conclusion. Deductive reasoning is the opposite of that. It uses general principles or law to forecast a specific, specific uh, results. So an example here given is, a specific example is Nala, which is an orange cat, and she purrs loudly. That's a very specific observation. And from that, a pattern recognition occurs that every orange cat that I have ever seen purrs loudly. Then the general conclusion based on that specific observation and pattern might be that all orange cats purr loudly. Albeit, albeit simple and incorrect, but that's one general conclusion you can make. Uh, both types of logical thinking, both inductive and deductive, uh, are related to two main pathways of scientific studies, descriptive science and hypothesis-based science. Dis descriptive science, or discovery science, sometimes it's called, they aim to uh, observe, explore, and discover the principles. Whereas hypothesis-based science aim, aims to test a potential answer to a specific problem. And often most scientific endeavors combine both approaches.
So how do you hypothesize? We do this practically every day, many of us. You start with an observation that is interesting or puzzling. Then you make a guess as to the reason or the cause behind the observation. For instance, my coffee maker isn't making coffee. Why is that? Then the question, that's the observation. Then you make a guess as to the reason. Is the machine on? So if answer is yes, or if answer is no, you see both leads to a different second step. So if the machine is on, and if it's in, it is in making coffee, then you should ask, is there coffee and water in the machine? That's quite natural to ask. If the power is not on, machine is not on, then you should ask, is the electricity out? One of the many questions that can be asked. So if a uh, machine is on and that there is coffee and the, uh, water in the machine, then obviously the machine is broken. And if there is no coffee and water in the machine, and if, if your coffee maker is not making coffee, then that makes sense. And you should test to see if putting coffee and water solves the problem. And then it would either make coffee or didn't make coffee. If it didn't make coffee, then obviously the machine is broken. So <clears throat> a little more formally, step one in hypothesis testing involves making an observation. Observe, observe something of interest. Step two, question something about what you have observed. Then step three, you formulate a hypothesis, a possible answer to the question you asked. This hypothesis must be testable. It should also be falsifiable, meaning it can be disproven by experimental results. A hypothesis can be proven or eliminated, but it can never be uh, proven. Then you make, a, you make a prediction based on your hypothesis. Typically, this has a format of if something something, then something something. Then step five, you create an experiment to test your hypothesis. The experiment will have variables. A part of the, the experiment that varies or changes. And then experiment also needs to have controls. So this is the part of the experiment that does not change. Then you collect the data and results from the experiment. Then you form a conclusion after, after analyzing the results. <clears throat> uh, same idea, hypoth hypothesis testing in a flowchart format, make an observation ask a question, form a hypothesis, make the prediction, do the experiment, analyze the result. Either the results, hypothesis, uh, results support the hypothesis or results does not support the hypothesis. You can optionally report that result to someone else or if your hypothesis is not supported, then you go back to this step. Form a new hypothesis that answers the question and you repeat. It is, it is an arduous task. <clears throat> and there are two types of sciences from how, uh, from, uh, the, from the perspective of the purpose of the science. There are the basic sciences and the applied science, sciences. Basic sciences seek to expand the knowledge regardless of short-term application of that knowledge. It does not focus on developing a product or service of immediate public or commercial value. That's what basic science is. Applied science, we often call this technology, aims to use science to solve a real-world problem. It focuses on things like improving farming, agriculture, mechanized agriculture, curing diseases, saving animals, veterinarian sciences. Uh, most applied sciences will not be possible without basic sciences. Some uh, questions to ponder upon for this chapter. Uh, using some examples, exp explain how biology can be studied from microscopic approaches to global approach. 
ecologists are the people who study population of individuals, populations, community, ecosystem, ecosystems, parts, and biosphere. That's a global, global approach. But there are scientists called virologists. These are people who study viruses. And if virus is not, the virus is not considered a life, living thing, why is a virologist considered a biologist? Because viruses infect biological organisms. So, well, um, give an example of how applied science has direct effect on your daily life. I think of a steak. It's good to eat, but how, how is it manufactured? Is the cow's grass fed? Is it fed soy? Is it open grazed? Is it factory farmed? Many of these cases, cows are treated with modern medicine, given antibiotics, processed using modern factory equipment. Okay.